Welcome everyone to our uh, U.S. Industry Outlook series. Um, this is Valerie van der Kivas. I'm the co-MD at Delsha. I think most of you are uh, very familiar with our organization, but just to recap, we're the Belgian American Chamber of Commerce and really our main goal um, and our main purpose is to help our Belgian and by extension European friends to not only discover but also enter and hopefully grow uh, in the US market. Um, with, uh, with COVID-19, of course, a lot of our worlds have changed dramatically. A lot of our businesses have been disrupted. And a lot of our industries are um, really looking differently these days. Uh, with that, we decided to organize uh, what we call a US Industry Outlook Series. And for these series, we, um, we invite every time uh, an investor or somebody who's very familiar with the investment uh, landscape, as well as a, a mentor or advisor, and then um, a scale-up or startup uh, with European heritage uh, that is showing incredible uh, American growth. With that, um, these are our speakers uh, for today day. And for those who are just joining, please uh, put your name, your title, as well as the company you work for uh, in the chat. So we have a good idea of who's on the phone today. We have about 20 uh, something participants. So thank you again for joining. Um, on the agenda today, we have uh, Peter, who's the partner at SOSV, as well as the managing director of one of the uh, leading, uh, if not the leading, uh, food accelerator um, in the US called FoodX. We also have Michael Sass, who's the president and CEO of Across Foods, as well as Rube Hell, who's the sales manager in the US for Tony's Chocoloni, uh, an incredible uh, cool chocolate brand uh, that has been uh, taking the US by storm. Uh, I've asked all three to share uh, their perspective, a little bit on their background, uh, their world, as well as some of their um, insights on what's currently happening, happening in the food and beverage industry. Each of them will take, let's say, you know, five to eight minutes to introduce themselves. And then I'll have a, a couple of questions prepared just to keep the conversation going. But I would uh, encourage you to um, start jotting down your questions uh, in the chat and we'll keep track and we'll answer uh, or try to answer as many as possible during the time we have together. We only have an hour, so we'll keep it short, sweet, and hopefully very engaging. And like I said, please don't hesitate to, uh, to ping us in the chat so we can really answer your questions because that's why we're here today. We don't want to talk to a wall. We want to talk with you and really uh, know what's on your minds. And I'm 100% certain that these three experts um, will be able to um, really inspire us and, and give us some, some new thoughts on what's happening uh, in their respective uh, areas. So with that, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Peter. Uh, again, Managing Director at Foodex and uh, partner at SOSV. Thanks so much, Valerie, and, and thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. So uh, a quick overview of, of myself and Foodex. So uh, I'm Peter, and I am the, the partner and the director at Foodex. Uh, my background is really on the operational side of startups. I started my career way back when as a chef and then moved into tech startups and did uh, either joined early companies or founded my own companies over the next 20 years or so. And somehow luck would have it, I was able to bring all of the things that I love together and be involved in early stage companies that were working in technology and food technology and bring food back to the table. Um, and it actually, strangely enough, today is my, my three-year anniversary of joining SOSV. So it, it works out. And FoodX is, it, it was started before I joined, but it's the number one food, I like to call it food system innovation. And what we do is we work with early stage companies across the food supply chain. So that could be everything from ag tech to supply chain innovation to retail technologies ingredient technologies, platforms and marketplaces, and ultimately also CPG companies with a very specific focus on food as medicine and upcycled ingredients. Um, we can go to the next slide if you don't mind. So uh, for those that don't know, an accelerator is uh, 
a program. It's a, it's a distinct period of time where we work with companies. We run two of them a year. Traditionally, we're actually changing that up a little bit this year with uh, coronavirus and everything that's happened. So we're going to spend a little more time with our existing portfolio of 94 companies that we've invested in over 11 cohorts. Um, we generally see about 1,000 startups, maybe as many as 1,200 that apply per year. Um, we have 16 spots, eight, eight companies per cohort twice a year, make an initial investment of about $125,000, take 10% equity in the company, and then we follow on. So SOSV is the venture capital firm that owns and operates Foodex, and the current fund that we're working off of is $280 million US. So we're, we're looking to deploy capital early, work with companies very closely, and then continue to be an investor throughout that journey. Um, next slide. So the, the idea of food is, is very broad, as we all know. So we have some buckets that we focus on. Um, and of course, the OCD part of me is realizing I didn't line up these titles very well, but such is life. Um, so human health, and that's where food is medicine really steps in, functional foods, technologies that allow people to eat better, know more about what's being put in their bodies, know more about their bodies and the different compounds within food that, that impact them. Um, and so that's one area of focus for us. Sustainability, and this really is around uh, planetary health. So um, is that reducing the, the waste that so we're using more of what we produce, upcycling ingredients, so taking waste product and using that to repurpose it. Uh, sustainable packaging is something that we, we haven't yet made any meaningful investments in, but an area we're really interested in, we believe is critically important to the future. And in general, sustainable alternatives to existing products. And then finally, it's, it's the ecosystem, and this is a little bit of a catch-all. Um, this is where a lot of the software and technologies that we invest in come through. So uh, B2B, supply chain, things that are around agricultural tech, and optimizing the supply chain, which as we've seen from COVID, and I'll talk about in a, in a second, you know, we've seen a lot of fractures in supply chains based on the recent challenges. Uh, next, next slide, please. So one of the things that we talked about in the prep for this call was sort of what do we look for, giving people an idea of what we think about when we're making an investment. Every investor is different. And so I don't want to speak for all investors, but, but there's a sort of saying of team, technology, and market. And for us, it's a little bit different in that I think it's team differentiation, and that can be a technology, and then market. So uh, first and foremost, at the stage we invest in, it's about the team. Do they have relevant experience? Is there a reason that this team is doing what they're doing? Or is it just an opportunistic, hey, we think we can build a big business? Neither is right or wrong, but we care to know those things. Um, is it is it an idea team or is it a team that has the ability to execute? We see, we see a lot of great ideas out there, but there's a long way between idea and execution. And then do people go in eyes wide open? Um, the, the statistics for startups are horrible. Most fail miserably. And strangely, we're looking for people that understand those statistics and know the odds that are against them but also deep down believe that they're the exception to the rule and they're the one that's going to make it through there. Um, in terms of differentiation, protectable IP and in food that, that can be really hard. Brand is often the biggest moat. Um, and for some investors, brand is enough of a moat because they are brand builders and that's what they do. If that's your big moat, you need to find that kind of investor who can really bring added value there. Um, understanding where you fit in the landscape is critically important. And then also timing, you know, are you at the right place at the right time? I was talking to a founder of a non-food company recently who said that if they had started their company 
three years before they did, they'd probably still today be at the very same point, assuming they were able to survive those extra three years because the market wasn't quite ready for what they were doing. And then in the market, I think, especially in food is, you know, what the hell does venture scale mean? Um, any, any company can be venture scale when they get big enough, but do you have enough of a market to get there? Um, are you playing in a very crowded space or is there a lot of white space? And there are different upsides and downsides to both of those, so I won't go into them. And then, you know, how big can it get? And is it a big market already? Or can you convince me that it's a growing market that's going to get exceptionally big? Uh, finally, I think this was just, I wanted, uh, sorry, next slide. Um, the, I, I thought this was a really interesting indication of what's going on in the world right now. If you look at the online grocery delivery and pickup market, it's grown 600% over the last year because of coronavirus. We always talk about changing behavior being the hardest thing to do. And all of a sudden overnight, the whole world has had consumer behavior change. So that creates a massive amount of opportunity here. And with that, we can go to the next slide, but I'll even skip over that a little bit. I think, you know, we, we see supply chains being a big, big opportunity and a big, big problem right now. Um, and so we're looking for people that are working on solutions around that. How do you create more adaptable, more flexible, and frankly, more localized supply chains so that you don't see the kind of disruption that we did in recent months? And with that, I'll shut the hell up and pass it on so that I don't take up too much time. Thank you, Peter. And, and fun fact, Jean Van Damme, who's a recent graduate from your uh, FoodX program, is also on the line. So for those who also want to hear from a startup experience on FoodX, I'm sure Jean... Oh, oh will... shit. Now he can tell the truth about me. <laughs> Busted. Um, uh, Peter, thank you for that. For those on the phone, uh, feel free to already start um, you know, thinking about questions for Peter. We'll open it up to questions soon, uh, but the chat uh, is, is fair game at this point. Uh, in the meantime, I um, will turn it over to uh, Michael, who's the founder and CEO of Across Foods, uh, for him to shed some uh, light on his experience and his background. Michael? Okay, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so much to talk about, so little time. Um, I'm always passionate when it concerns talking about food and the U.S. food market, so I'm eager to uh, share some of my experience with you. Um, at Across Foods, if you can move to the next slide, um, we basically provide business services to food exporters, mainly from Europe and importers here in the U.S. Um, my product shelf life, as I call it, goes from one year uh, before the potential launch of a new item up until more or less five years after a company has entered the U.S. market. Um, we start with sharing some market intelligence, strategic recommendations, uh, move over to actual sales and business development in case there's positive feedback. Once you start selling, you got to take care of your structure. You need back office activities mainly focused on ocean freight forwarding, local warehousing, but as well order processing. Um, I'm sure uh, Ruben can uh, as well attest to that. And then at a later stage or uh, from the beginning, uh, there may be a need for a corporate uh, governance, meaning incorporation process, uh, setting up your US subsidiary and trying to manage that from a uh, good father perspective. All right, um, a lot of things to talk about. I'm just going to touch on a few topics uh, based on my experience over the past 16 years launching new items on the U.S. market. A lot of topics that companies don't necessarily take into consideration before they come to the U.S. market or underestimate once they're up there. So um, the U.S. market is very complex. It's uh, um, understanding that complexity, understanding the market structure can avoid making mistakes. We're dealing with buyers, we're dealing with brokers, we're dealing with wholesale distributors, we're dealing with physical distributors, we're dealing with uh, decision making on a national level, on a regional level. You can deal with co-ops, buying organizations. Uh, sometimes there are different legislation for different states. For instance, California has Prop 65, which is causing some turmoil again. 
Um, if you're dealing with alcohol-based products, you're going to have to deal with the licenses per state. So it's very complicated. Don't underestimate it. Another topic of importance was the introduction of the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2017 under the Obama administration, where actually the um, responsibility of importing food was transferred from the exporter to the importer on the U.S. side. Um, as a consequence, for instance, um, you need to set up a foreign supplier verification program, the FSVP program. You need a qualified individual. But practically speaking, some of your customers, some of your regional distributors, your buyers at retail chains or at food service level, they may not want to deal with this responsibility. So you're going to have to look at alternatives to overcome that situation. Um, entry barriers as well, uh, something to look at for yourself. What are my entry barriers? Could be market protection. We see that the Trump administration is putting on a lot of uh, increased tariffs, new tariffs, just out of retaliation or just to um, protect the market. Um, we're dealing as well with uh, things like equivalence status between nations. Um, are we allowed in Belgium to export pork meat into the US? Um, so those are legislations, those are agreements on, at a state level. You need to look at your uh, permits, you need to look at your certificates that are needed, you need to look at import quota, um, especially when you're working in the cheese industry. Uh, you need to look at very practical things. Um, a lot of US customers still like to pay by means of check, something that's completely out of order in Europe for many, many years. But if you're not in a situation where you can accept payments by check, then uh, you may uh, face some, uh, some issues there. Business preparedness, um, when you have the opportunity to be speaking to a buyer, uh, make sure you are prepared, make sure you are aware um, how the store looks like, um, which product you are going to replace. Most likely it's not going to be an addition to an existing category, but most likely you will be replacing somebody else. Um, think about uh, sending samples to US markets, requires a lot of sample shipments. If you are shipping dry products, then that's okay. If you are shipping frozen bakery products, then that cost is going to be very high after a while. Um, sometimes I'm receiving some, some requests here in my office, like, okay, can we send you some samples to evaluate if this is something of potential interest? And please share your FedEx account with me so we can ship the samples. This is, of course, completely not done in the US if you ship samples, you're going to have to pay for them yourself. Um, be realistic. What are your objectives in case you want to enter the US market? Um, are your objectives, are they corresponding to the budget that you can make available? Um, is the timing right? I'm always saying to my customers, um, there is a, um, for, for each strategic recommendation, you require a budget, and for each budget, you require a, a certain uh, strategic recommendation. But um, make sure that they match and that the timing is right. Okay, next slide, please. Um, another topic I just wanted to touch on are different expansion strategies. I don't think it's any different than in any other part of the world, but just uh, maybe a refresher for everybody. When you are facing your entry into the US market, you're going to have to choose whether you are going to work through an importer, taking possession of your goods, paying you, but not necessarily sharing all the information that you would like to have, not being transparent. You can work with an agent who's going to be basically an extension of your export department. You are going to share more information back and forth, but the agent doesn't take possession. So um, you're going to have to... Um, still deal with your final customer in collecting your payment and in paying your agent uh, a broker commission. Third possibility is to set up your own subsidiary, US subsidiary, and um, start selling out of that entity. Um, decisions to make, uh, are, are you going to be working with brokers, independent sales agents that are, or are you going to employ full-time equivalent uh, salespeople for you? Maybe you're present in retail, but an expansion strategy could be to go to food service or vice versa. Or as Peter just mentioned, um, e-commerce is really booming these days, even developing further. So that's an alternative expansion strategy. 
If you deal with a branded product, you may consider going into private label, a huge opportunity here in the US market. Um, another interesting one is potentially if your product allows for it, you can sell in bulk to rebaggers, to rebottlers, um, uh, many opportunities. Uh, sometimes it's easier to enter the market like that before you uh, invest in developing your own brand name and supporting your own brand name. Another um, possible way of expanding your sales is through um, adding more trade channels. I think in the US, there is a bit more trade channel definitions as we're used to in Belgium and in Europe. So um, there's certainly um, expansion possibilities through different trade channels. Um, once you start expanding, please uh, consider uh, looking at your supply chain options. Um, you will need a local inventory most likely. Uh, potentially, you could look at having a co-manufacturing option here in the U.S. so you don't have to deal with the transportation overseas. Um, FCL, LCL, so um, if you start up, you can look into less than container load shipments per pallet. Of course, when you expand, uh, we're always talking about full container loads. And um, as a last item here, something that uh, Peter is um, master of, uh, mergers and acquisitions or takeovers <laughs> or investments. So. Uh, all right, he's waving his hand, so that's an agreement, I think. <laughs> a few key differentiators, um, do's and don'ts, uh, something that always comes back. We, we think that we know how to um, be successful here on the market, but then people seem to be repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Um, the US is a market that welcomes people with a positive uh, winner's attitude, with a positive mentality. Um, far too often in Europe and Belgium, um, if you're sitting together with a customer in a meeting, the answer comes up, no, it's impossible. It doesn't exist here. Never say no, it's impossible. Um, people in Europe usually look more um, at a product from, from its um, technical aspects, from its um, mentality like, okay, my product is going to sell itself. I don't need to do anything to it. In the US, it's more about a concept. It's not only the product, it's the packaging, it's the story on the packaging, it's the website that's behind it, it's, it's potentially um, your company's values and um, energy saving uh, methods or whatsoever. So it, it's more of a concept, it's less of just a unique product. Know as well that um, different trade channels have different price settings, have different price buildups. So as well, don't expect to come with one price that would fit all. That's never going to work. Um, my best advice would be uh, focus on a niche market. Don't think that you're going to conquer the US in, um, in one day, but don't necessarily divide the US market into geographical areas. That may not make sense. So it's better to focus on a niche over the entire nation rather than, oh, I'm going to start off in the Northeast because it may not work out that way. Give yourself time, give yourself at least a three year window in order to evaluate your um, successes, make adjustments, and um, last but not least, don't loosen up on your commitments. If you have dedicated a budget over three years, don't come back after the second year or after the first year and telling your partners like, okay, we're not going to make those budgets available as we promised, but we still expect you to come up with the objectives that we determined. Um, I believe that's more or less it, uh, Valerie. Maybe my contact information is there. Yeah. And yes, we're open for business. Um, I would love to help you out. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And um, looking forward to connecting with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Ruve, I'm going to make you the host right now so you can um, share your pitch. Uh, yeah. But I am 100% certain that you can shed some additional light on the concept versus product and niche markets. Uh, we've talked about um, how that has been a very important uh, lessons learned from uh, Tony Ciocoloni's perspective. So with that, uh, Ruben, I'm going to give you about, let's say, five to eight minutes so we can... Yeah. Give two questions uh, soon. Thank Can you see my screen? We're all good, yes. Good, so uh, hello, my name is Ruben. I'm working for four years now at Tony's. 
the first three years in the Netherlands and now I'm responsible for sales and especially the strategy part of our sales in the United States. And actually I'm moving back in two months back to the Netherlands and one of my responsibilities will be the Belgian market. So that is, uh, there's a connection as well. Um, I can talk very long about uh, Tony's and our mission. Um, uh, well, a common practice for chocolate bars is to be straight and square. The truth is that the world is, of cocoa is very unequally divided. And I can tell you a lot of it, but I will show you a two minute video instead. Is it visible? Yeah, right? Ruben, there's no sound. Oh, I do hear it. Um, let me. Risk of child exploitation behind it. But call them, call Nestle, ask them, see what they say. Let's face it, slavery exists. Oh yeah? <laughs> Clearly. Because, they're, they, because they are so desperately poor. Because they, they don't get paid enough by Nestle or by the companies they All work right, for. That's it. Thank you very much and goodbye. Et puis on vous laisse jamais causer entre parents. Si on te voit causer avec ton parent, bon, on te tue ou bien, tu te mates très bien là et puis on te fait changer de compte. This is now the 21st century. It's, yeah. it's unthinkable that we would sit by and allow child slave labor to continue. No, il faut faire quelque chose, forcément. So this is the reason why I work for Tony's. Um, Tony's is an impact company. Let us tell you a little oh. something about our chocolate bar. Yes. It's unequally divided. We're an impact uh, company that makes chocolate and we want to uh, change uh, the industry to make it fair. And uh, that's also our claim. Together we'll make chocolate 100% slave free. Not only our chocolate, but the chocolate worldwide. Um, I can tell you a lot about it more, but uh, that can I can sh share some links afterwards if you want. Uh, let's dive into some United States data. I just pulled two or three slides out of our sales deck that we're sharing with customers right now to give you an idea uh, how we're doing right now. And I think for the question, the Q and A, it's nice to look into like how do we did we go into the market. Um, Tony's is a, a worldwide company these days. Uh, we're going to be close to 100 million the end of this book year. And uh, in the United States, we started five years ago. And as you can see, we're growing quite quickly. And this year we're going to meet 11 million of sales and we're sold in over 10,000 stores in the United States. So uh, that is really cool. And this year we really are, are experiencing our breakthrough, for example, with a national launch at Whole Foods uh, with all our items. Um, and Michael already said that there are several channels in the United States. Uh, we focused in the beginning on the niche um, natural channel, which is Whole Foods kind of like a sc of stores. Um, the whole natural channel is as big as the Dutch total retail channel to give you an idea, but it's still very small. In the natural channel, we are now the number two growth driver, only you chocolate, which is uh, paleo, keto, non-sugar, all that kind of stuff is only growing faster than we do. And at Whole Foods, that's the, the bottom uh, uh, graph, we are growing by far the large, the biggest uh, of all uh, brands. So that is really cool to see. And uh, right now we will be the number five brand in the end of the year at Whole Foods. 
And also, uh, we're now going to go more and more to conventional retail, uh, the food channel. Um, and, and there we are now within the natural brands. Um, we are the number four growth driver. Um, but in percentage wise, we're the biggest growth driver of the category. Stores that we're going now is not like a Walmart yet or um, or all Kroger banners, but we really choose to do the more high end retailers like Wegmans, Mariano's. We just launched at Fred Meyer and Hannaford. Um, Fred Meyer is on the West Coast, probably not all of you will know that chain. Um, and, but we also resonate really well in, for example, food service. Uh, for example, we are given away in all uh, Google uh, headquarters uh, in their test kitchens. We are um, at, at Nike, at Facebook, at Netflix. Microsoft is a partner with us. So that's really cool because there is our uh, consumer. And of course, it's also a marketing tool because if they know us, they will buy us in store. And we just launched in June uh, in CVS in 2,300 doors. Uh, which is also really cool to get like global, uh, national uh, availability. And what about our brand awareness? The United States is huge, of course. So it's also really difficult to get a little bit of brand awareness. What we saw, we launched five years in the United States and our brand awareness is still right now lower than it was in the UK before we started in the UK because it's so much closer to the Netherlands and uh, you have the airports and stuff. Uh, here it's really difficult. Still, we're doing quite good the last last half a year. Um, rotten is a an episode uh, is a series about the the rotten industries in the in the food industry uh, on Netflix. And one of the episodes was about cocoa, and it was made together with Tony. So that was really cool. Uh, the Washington Post also had a really nice. Um, uh, 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 article about, well, not so nice, but about child labor in the industry. And we were mentioned there as well. You see a lot of other uh, uh, nice media wins that we had amongst them also uh, a live interview on CNN about uh, slavery in the industry. Um, actually, I can tell way more, um, but I think it's nicer to do that in the, in the Q&A to really uh, make sure that I tell what you want me to tell. Thank you, Luba. Can you just uh, quickly make me the host again? And uh, for, for everybody uh, on the phone, please, uh, please jump in uh, with questions. But let me just ask one quick question to Ruba uh, already. I I'm just curious, um, you, you're making the decision to move uh, your operations and move your office from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, actually, your office is opening today. So curious why that uh, decision was made. And then two, what do, you, what do you think is the biggest challenge for Tony's in the, in the next, let's say six to 12 months related or unrelated to, uh, to COVID? Yeah, so the reason why we started in Portland, Oregon is mainly because there was, they found a Dutch guy that was willing to, um, to, to start here and he lived in Portland. And that was one of the reasons. Another reason is that this region, the, the West Coast region is quite progressive. This natural channel is quite big here, especially in Portland. There was also a lot of food trends uh, that start here. And uh, so that was a good match. For example, still one of our biggest customers is New Seasons Markets, only 20 doors, but are one of the biggest retailers in the United States in the natural channel due to uh, the velocities that they have. And um, what we see the last two years is that New accounts are coming more and more from the, the East Coast or the whole country. And a lot of the, the headquarters are also in the East Coast. Uh, so that is a, an important reason why we're moving to New York. The time difference with the Netherlands is, is, a, is an important reason because nine hours time difference makes it really difficult to connect for a long time. Like everybody is, I think, now in their afternoon or uh, in their evening. And for me, it's still uh, 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, a third reason is uh, talent. So um, uh, we, we were struggling with finding the right talent for the right jobs. Uh, maybe that's also one of the reasons why I was flew in from the Netherlands. Um, and uh, we expect, and we already see that, that it's easier in New York. And challenges for the next 12 months. Uh, well, first is the ambition of our owner. He's always very ambitious. So. Uh, we're almost doubling our sales, but we're not meeting our targets. 
Um, but second, it's really like focus. Uh, we see that we get more and more pools, so requests from retailers. Um, but we really want to go only to, um, to the retailers that fit us. Like Michael said, like maybe start first with a niche. And, and that's what we try to do, but it's really difficult because are you going to say no to a retailer that is, is wanting you in all their 300 doors? And uh, what we see is doing business in the United States is really expensive. Uh, going to a new retailer is really expensive and velocities are way lower. So for example, in the Netherlands, we sell 30, 40 bars per week per store of the caramel sea salt. Here, most retailers do only one or a CVS does only one third a week per store. So that means that your return on investment is way uh, longer. And, uh, and you also have issues of, uh, of best buy dates that, are, uh, that, that products are going to over the due date. So you really have to be careful that you're not going too fast to retailers that are not interesting for you yet. So that is, I think for us, the biggest challenge, like how to define the retailers where we have to go right now. And if I can just build off that, I'd say for anybody with a product company, with a, with a consumer good, that's been one of the biggest challenges we've seen or mistakes that people make is, you know, the nice thing about coming to a market like the U.S. versus Europe is that you can go across the whole country like that. But supporting that growth is a very different proposition. Yeah. And we have seen a lot of companies that it sounds great to get national distribution through Whole Foods or some other retailer. But then the cost structure of supporting that and everyone sort of knows in the industry, you mentioned velocities are critically important. And, you know, the category managers all have their spreadsheet and you're either above that line or you're below it. And if you're below it in terms of velocity and sales, you're gone. And it's really hard to get back in after that. So being really thoughtful about how you grow your footprint geographically and retailer wise is really a critical step. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. And I'm just gonna piggyback on that because I see Xavier submitted a, a follow on question for Rubo. What makes it cheaper to start working with a new retailer in Europe versus- Yeah. Um, well, one of the things is definitely indeed the logistics. Like for example, in the Netherlands or in Belgium, you ship uh, uh, you have to drive one hour with a couple of pallets to a retailer. Here you ship uh, half a pallet to a distributor who ships it to a retailer. And there can also be a redistributor and even an extra, it can be like three or four addresses before it arrives at the, at the retailer. So logistical costs are way higher. And almost every retailer um, demands a free fill, which means a free case uh, of product, uh, which sometimes also happens in the Netherlands. I don't know about Belgium, but in the Netherlands, then we just did a free shipment directly. Uh, here we ship it to the distributor and the distributor has a list price, which is for example, around 40% higher than the price that we get for it. And they charge us that 40% extra. Um, we have a high case count. So that's also one of the learnings um, that I would recommend others go. If you go to the United States, make sure that your case count is not too big. Um, because we are shipping 15 bars for free to all those retailers um, well, uh, of 180 grams, which is also twice as much as uh, the, the, the regular bars here. Uh, and you pay 40% more for those free fills than, um, than uh, we get in for it. So the, the investment per store per item is often uh, somewhere between 50 and 70 bucks for us. Uh, well, their velocities are only one per store per week, which means that the return on that we only we we are selling that bar that case that free case that we made a loss on for the first four months of the year of of the year. So after four months, you get finally some return and, and some sales, but then you still have a higher cost price than what you sold. So it's and if you do that like with 20 retailers at one time and you get delisted at a couple of retailers, then um, you have a pro financial problem. And I think 
that's also what you're seeing in the United States, that there are a lot of brands starting up very quickly, gaining a lot of uh, distribution, and three years later, they're gone because they're bankrupt. And you have to pay for the, the, those delistings as well. So that's a double whammy because you didn't get any money for it. You paid that volume, but you can also pay for the discount to sell it out of the stores. I think you're on mute, uh, Valerie. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for chiming in. Uh, talking about distribution and sales, um, uh, Michael and, and Peter, I, I think this question might be um, relevant for, for both of you to ponder upon. It's a question from Raf, who, uh, who's asking, do you think the food industry can get to a point where they trade like used cars, for example, so directly without any brokers, but based on reports and data where um, maybe buyers and sellers leave reviews on transactions? You can, you can read the question in the, in the chat as well. Any, any thoughts, Michael, maybe you can start? I think that's uh, a bit wishful thinking at this moment. I think many people would like that to happen. Um, many European companies want to take that shortcut and think that they can do without a broker. But at the end of the day, the broker has the relationship. The broker um, has the one, has the office that's dealing with all the paperwork. I'm not sure that all the exporters, manufacturers want to deal with all that paperwork. So. Yeah, you see, you see some change in tendencies these days during COVID when people are indeed more um, open towards uh, virtual presentations instead of meeting at a trade show or meeting at the office. But um, maybe some of that will go, but I, I still see a long-term um, view from a broker's perspective that that's going to stay. I, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I think to go all the way the vision you're stating there is, it's hard, right? Like, I think that's a big leap from where we are today. There, there are likely steps in between that. And perhaps it starts with, you know, a few savvy tech enabled brokerages that start to provide more of that sense that it's a seamless process, as opposed to a very traditional, I think, to the, to the point Ruben was making about the distributors here, UNFI and Kehi and the natural channel are the two big, you know, 800 pound gorillas and they treat emerging brands like shit, frankly, um, and brands that don't have leverage. So I think the use of technology, there are some platforms that are being developed both on the distribution side, but I'm starting to see people focus on that import export problem as well. So my guess is there'll be options that aren't just the traditional way of doing it but to get all the way to that point where it's like used cars i think that's a, if if even possible it's a long way off just because of the perishable nature and food safety and you're dealing with regulatory at so many different steps if i may add on to that you see like platforms uh, range me i'm not sure if, if everybody's familiar with that where you can indeed as, an, as, a, as, a, as a maker present your products to certain buyers. Um, if they are interested in it, they will let you know. It works on some occasions, but it's not like one great big success where it's taking over the industry. It is a, it is a tool, it is a step in between as Peter is mentioning. Is it going to replace it? I don't think so. What we, what we I think 80% of our business is going via brokers. Um, and I think especially in the natural channel, you have to also in, 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 in grocery overall, the market is way more complex than uh, the Netherlands or Belgium, like the Netherlands or Belgium, you have a couple of, of like say five to 10 retailers, and then you have 95% of the market for us, uh, for, for Tony's uh, here, like the chains are often smaller than in, in Europe. So you have to. And, and, and the country is quite a bit bigger. So it's, it's, you need the, those broker teams there to go to door by door and to go to those headquarters. And also because their assortments of the retailers are so big, they often demand you to use a broker because they want to have like one contact for five brands and not five contacts for five brands. And um, now we are growing at some retailers. We're able to take over the conversation bit by bit because what we do see is that especially like a brand of ours, like we want to tell our story. We want to show them what we're doing in, their, in our mission, that we're different, that we do it, a business in another way. And 
brokers have difficulties with telling that story. Um, mm -hmm. So they're only like coming with solutions about in price and stuff. And we don't want, we, ha we want to have another conversation with a retailer. So mm -hmm. it's- Which I think leads back to this idea, like, you know, Whole Foods going into Whole Foods, they're going to demand you have a broker and a distributor because they're not going to deal with a smaller brand. Whereas if you attack sort of a regional play and you say, we're going to work with these three or four retailers, you can perhaps get to that point where you build the direct relationship earlier than you can with the big nationwide, you know, Whole yeah. Foods or Target or Walmart or Kroger or, yeah. or, or groups like that. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is that Kroger really, uh, uh, Whole Foods really chose for us is actually with Whole Foods, we do have the most in intensive direct relation. Um, but overall, you're definitely right on, on, on that. Like New Seasons here is local. Um, there, that is one of the customers where, that, where we have a lot of direct contact with. Yeah. Thank you, Riva. And uh, maybe uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, being mission driven and uh, obviously for Tony's, uh, you know, the, the purpose message is, is really strong. Um, actually curious from Peter's perspective, how that maybe uh, filters into your decisions in terms of mm -hmm. um, investing in companies or choosing companies to participate in Foodex. And then together with that, so as an investor standpoint and from a consumer standpoint, do you see that being, being really critical in the success of, um, of the companies that you work with? So I think having a why, I mentioned, you know, what is that why for people is critically important. Whether that's a mission or a problem they see that needs to be solved or, you know, something, something else, that's okay. I think in investment, there's also a little bit of a loaded phrase when you talk about impact investing. Mm -hmm. um, right or wrong, people say, oh, impact investment, that means they're not really worried about a return. Um, we are, in fact, very, very much worried about a return. And the way that I like to see it framed up is I'd always rather hear the benefits of the business and in standing on its own two legs as a business. And then, oh, by the way, it also creates this positive impact on the globe because from an investment standpoint, you, we have to make smart decisions about the companies and they have to be viable venture scale businesses if they in fact are also doing something that positively impacts the food system or the planet or you know, a workforce in West Africa. Like these are all amazing things that are important to us, but they become sort of a secondary decision point in a lot of ways. No, I understand. And from a consumer, consumer perspective, um, mission, purpose? Um... Critically important. I think even in becoming more so every single day, I think the, the younger generations purchase brands that they have, you know, you hear the term lifestyle brand all the time. And people want to buy products that match with their perception of who they are, what their values are. There's more transparency than there's ever been. Um, and that's why when you see a, a bigger brand trying to fake some sort of authenticity around, you know, the way their, you know, the, the brand started or the, the backstory, if, if people find out that that's not accurate, like it can really backfire on people. So uh, I think that you know, having a why and having a story and an impact for a brand like Tony's Chocolony is, is hugely valuable and probably drives a lot of their sales ultimately. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I guess it, it's even augmented during uh, times of COVID, right? Where, where people are actually really paying attention to how businesses are responding in, in every possible way. I, I think a little bit at first it wasn't. It was sort of the, the opposite. You saw this move back to people eating comfort, at least in the U.S., and I'll, I'll give it a U.S. focus, which is, you know, people were eating more Doritos and crap food and, you know. Luckily, meat. and chocolate. <laughs> and chocolate, right. They were going for comfort foods. Yeah. Um, but that was just whatever they could get because there was panic buying going on and things like that. I think now that what you said is true like now 
people are, it, it sort of re renews that focus on why am I buying what I'm buying and what is, what is the, the story? What is the, the background? What does the supply chain look like? Am I, can I feel good about making this purchase? Once the scarcity is gone, of course, yeah. during this COVID. So um, I just wanted to add on to that by sharing a couple of quotes that I heard from the uh, VP of supply chain at Unify. He said that um, just in time, our, our supply chain model of just in time is going to change to just in case. So you will see that inventory levels will start increasing just in case this is going to last longer, just in case this is going to get worse or go, go for a second wave. So I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, as well, I was um, told that at this moment, about 30% of distribution is up for grabs because you have a change from food service to retail. You have a change from retail to e-commerce. You have a change from some very high expensive products more to commodity-based products. So there's about 30% up for, for grabs at this moment as to who's going to take the space, who is going to be able to move this into a new direction. I think that's as well important for everybody who's looking at the U.S. market today. There are opportunities. There are still opportunities out there. So don't be afraid to, to, to take the step to make the plunge. Thank you. And in terms of um, some other things that you're seeing in the ecosystem, what are, what are some important trends or like... Um, I guess a popular concept these days, for example, I've been reading a lot about ghost kitchens. Is that really a thing? Is that, is that going to make a huge impact on, on, um, on, you know, the food industry and maybe also reflect a little bit on the beverage industry, because we have a couple of people who are active uh, beverage and alcohol industry. Are there any trends there that you're seeing that, that pique your interest or that you're specifically tracking? I mean, I go, go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead, Peter. I think there, that's a that's a lot of stuff. I think in alcohol, low ABV and no ABV, so low alcohol, no alcohol is really an interesting place right now. Um, again, a lot of it is is brand and getting things in the right packaging at the right retailers, so that they're perceived a very specific way. Um, in terms of some of the other products, I, I, this to me doubles down on the move to plant-based. Um, I just believe that we've seen going back to the supply chain hiccups and how dangerous, you know, uh, slaughterhouses are and they're not places that can work in the environment of a COVID. Um, it's going to drive uh, an even further increase in adoption of plant-based and there was just yep. a stat the other day about the growth when they put plant-based meats in the meat section at stores it's like a 20 or 29 percent increase uh in sales just from that placement mm. big trend today are like nutrition bars based on uh, pea protein on, on vegetable based proteins Mm -hmm. uh, as well in the cereal category, for instance, you're going to vegetable-based cereals, um, bean-based cereals. Those are the new tendencies there. Um, as to the drink market, the drink industry, uh, more back to basics, uh, if possible. Uh, that's in general, not specifically for beverages, but um, back to basics. And um, local will, will expand again as well because people don't want to be waiting on all these items that are coming from all over the world without really having control of, of, of what's in there. Yeah, and um, uh, anything from a tech perspective? Some, some folks on the phone are, are in food tech. Um, maybe Peter, maybe a question for you since you work with a lot of food tech companies. Well, I think there's, again, you know, I'm hammering on supply chain a lot. I think visibility, transparency, uh, traceability, provenance, all of those words keep popping up more and more that we're seeing. So how do you see, um, how do you get a better feel for what's in the supply chain, where the potential problems are, how can you track it more transparently? Um, I think an, another area on technology is anything related to direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Um, 
you know, you, you've seen what's happened with Shopify stock throughout this. Um, that that's still an opportunity. They're they're a, a big beast of a company, but there are ways for people to develop uh, product lines that are specialized to different types of industries. Um, and then I think you know I'll I'll give Jean a little shout out here. I think companies that are using AI and data in an interesting way. Uh, in in the case of Esther, for flavor analysis and product development and uh, that's a really interesting area. So there's so much data that's been created or that is being created every single day, but how are you then taking that data and what can be done with it that actually creates actionable insights for people and not just, hey, here's another dashboard with a bunch of data that the operator of whatever type of food business it is doesn't really know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're almost at our time. I, I wanted to maybe ask one question because I, I think Raf brought up a good point. Whenever we talk about trends or, you know, insights, um, we have to remember that the U.S. is a big place and what, what rings true on the East Coast might not be as popular or might be different on the West Coast. So question for all three of you, how do you, how do you keep your finger on the polls? How do you, how do you gather market insights and, and what might be your recommendation for people on the phone to, to start understanding the U.S. market better? Um, maybe any thought leaders that you follow, books, uh, things that you're, you're keeping track of or, or other? If I if I can can start like I think for us that's a, definitely a reason why we started at the West Coast as I said earlier on. Um, what we do see is like we started in the natural and specialty gourmet channel, and those are the stores where people that want to buy Tonys go to, and those stores are mostly on the East Coast and the West Coast, and some in the Midwest. So. Um, Due to the fact that we chose that channel, we already automatically sort of, uh, those retailers already decided where to go uh, because uh, they, know, they know if they go somewhere like in the Midwest that they won't do enough sales to uh, have a viable store. Um, so that is for us the, the most important reason, but we do see that the West Coast and then uh, the Northeast is, is, are the best two regions for us in, in, in terms of people willing to buy to pay a bit more for for a mission uh, uh, ethical company ethical chocolate I, I think if i understood the question well it's about where do we get our um validation our information Correct. Um, there are so many webinars these days um online specialty food association has two a week um, national confectioners association has some as well so there's so much information out there. We're, we're connecting with people we never heard of before. I mean, listening to VPs of supply chain of Unify, listening to people of KE, listening of buyers, listening to buyers of Whole Foods. So there's a lot of information out there. I would even say more than before. So if there's an advantage to COVID, it is that uh, we can obtain more information and get a better finger on the pulse of, of how these people are thinking and what we need to do in order to have a chance of being successful together with them. I'll just throw out a couple. Food Tech Connect is a great uh, newsletter that comes out every day aggregating news. Food Dive is another one that I think is good. The Spoon Tech is, is also another one. And then um, I think combined with some of these other things, gives you a good sense of what's going on in the, in the space in the US. Awesome. Okay, with that, uh, we are right at our time and I wanna be uh, very thoughtful of everybody's schedule, but I, I really thank you so, so much, uh, Michael, Peter and, and Ruba for your time. Wish you all the best in these next couple of um, still quite uncertain months. For all the people on the phone, um, we will make sure you get connected to each other over email and we'll also include uh, the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers and potentially some resources that you guys can check out. We hope um, the conversation doesn't stop here. Feel free to continue to reach out to us with questions or comments. Um, this is going to be an ongoing series. I know you're all 
very deep into food, but our next session will be on ed tech. So you can keep your eyes and ears open for, for some of these next conversations if you're, if you're planning to broaden your scope, who knows. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, thank you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, stay connected. Let's be successful together. Thank you. Thank you.